Oh, how are you? All right. Hey, listen, before we get going right now, um, you guys are all aware of Israel. What's going on, right? Everything. So um, this whole dynamic changes things that's going on. So we're going to just ask all of you to keep your Bibles open. Make sure that you're reading the book of Ezekiel chapter 38. If somebody says, what could possibly be the correlation biblically with what's happening in Israel right now? There's only uh, one of two answers. Uh, there's, there's two, but they both might weld or uh, blend together. Read Isaiah 17 and read Ezekiel 38. We could be seeing that happen right now. What happened last night with Iran attacking Israel? This is a big deal. You say, well, Jack, there wasn't much damage. This is true. Much of the Iranian equipment um, could not penetrate through uh, the Israeli, the British, and the American defense systems that were predominantly in the area of um, Iraq. Uh, Jordan, the king, King Abdullah, just stayed out of it and, and let things play out because he's smart. Uh, but what got through... Uh, Israel's Iron Dome took care of a lot of that, and David's sling uh, took care of that. But get a load of this. I've been talking to the uh, news bureau chief in Jerusalem for Newsmax, and uh, David was telling me that there's something in the area of 93% of the uh, attack inventory, be it drones, be it missiles, be it rockets, 93% of that that made it through Everything else and God over Israeli airspace, over Jerusalem, over Tel Aviv, 93% of it was destroyed by the Iron Dome or the Arrow or the David Sling system, which is remarkable. That's really remarkable. Just keep your eyes on the news. This is not going to go away. This is teeing up. And, and my source is the, Islam, what the messages that are being preached in mosques around the world. You see, that's a weird source. It is, isn't it? You should all be going to memri.org. Everybody should be going to that website. It's free, memri.org. They post um, sermons from mosques around the world, and right now they're all teaching and saying the same thing. You may not believe this, or you may not like to hear this, but they, they believe that their hour has come. This is time for global jihad. That's what they believe. You say, well, I don't believe it. You don't have to believe it. They believe it. So stay tuned and be alert. You know that person you've been wanting to tell Jesus about? Now's the time to do it. Now's the time to do it. Father, we come before you. We ask you, Lord God, that you cause the clock to stand still. You did it for Joshua. You could do it for us today. Cause the clock to stand still. May we have a time in your word that when we leave here today, that we are encouraged, just as the scripture says, that your word has been given to exhort us, to instruct us, to correct us, and to give us all that is needed to live godliness out in an unbelieving world. So Father, we pray now that you would be very, very present. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Well, you guys, it's absolute thrill to be here. I had no plans on being here. Uh, Lisa was coming, and I don't pay attention much because my world is going every which way. So sometimes Lisa and I, we get the, our trains get to pass and stop for a little bit and talk. And uh, so this whole thing came out to where, wait a minute, I'm, go I, I, I'm gonna go, I get to go. And so I have to tell you something. Um, how many of you are from California? Raise your hands. Seriously, this is by far out of the services last night. How many of you from Chino Hills? Raise your hand. How could you? That's awesome. That's amazing. Well, I see why. I mean, I'm, I speak a lot of places all over, and I'm not, I'm not tempted. Uh, Chino Hills is awesome. We live in a little bubble. It's wonderful. But uh, we got here. And then I got lost. I went and took a drive. I got lost. I went places yesterday. <laughs> and it was like, wow, this is wonderful. So you guys are spoiled. Just remember, you're not in heaven yet. Okay? So I'm going to ask you to grab your Bibles today and turn to John chapter 14. John 14. We're going to talk about something that is getting more and more 
controversial. And I, I have to talk about something controversial to stay consistent with my life. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but on January 30th, I had no idea. On January 30th, I was invited by the House, the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, if I would open up the 118th Con Congress in prayer. And so I did that. And, you know, they tell you beforehand, you know, when you go to pray, uh, don't, you can't mention Jesus' name. I'm not kidding. You can't mention Jesus' name. Don't say anything that would you uniquely point out in your prayer that you are could be construed as evangelizing. You can say God because it's generic uh, and have a great time. <laughs> and I looked. I didn't say yes. I didn't say amen to that. I went to the podium and um, I said, let's pray. And so I said, Lord, I ask you to be here now in the name of your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our crucified Lord and Savior. And, and then I said, God, give guidance to those who make decisions for the welfare of this nation which belongs to you, right? That they will someday, as them granted authority, will give an answer to you in the day of judgment. I stepped off the podium... And this one congressman had tears in his eyes and said, I haven't heard a biblical prayer in years. And by the time I got out of the Capitol building, I had seven people give me a hug and give me a kiss and say, congressmen and women saying, thank you for that. I thought, what is that? This is normal. It's a normal prayer. It wasn't exactly normal because they don't know that I lifted for my prayer. I lifted three different quotes from three uh, different pastors who gave the congressional prayer from 1774 to about 18, uh, 1783. I just used American history. Next thing I know, I've been condemned by 26 members of Congress. <laughs> They're calling for, how is it that Mike Johnson picked this, this guy who's a radical Ilan Omar said he prayed in Jesus' name. There's, there's no such prayer. There, who's, no one's listening if you don't pray in Jesus' name. So anyway, let's stay consistent. Whatever we do, let's stay consistent. And this, this is consistent. It's this, John chapter 14. In fact, look at John 14 verse 1. All right, this is Jesus speaking. That's why in your Bible the letters are written in red. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Number one, Jesus is not saying God is God and I'm a God and you can believe in us. Jesus is saying in this statement, and it's kind of tough in the English language. If you're Jewish today, you'll know exactly what he's saying because when someone says in the Jewish culture, this is my father or this is my son, especially more technically, this is my oldest son. And if somebody says, I want to speak to the father. I want to speak to the owner of this business. Who owns it? My father owns it. Who are you? I'm his son. Oh, then I can talk to you. It's different in, in our Western culture. In the Middle Eastern culture, the son is one with the father. When Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. Jesus is actually saying, put the same faith that you have in the father. Remember, at this moment, he's speaking to a bunch of Jewish disciples. The faith you've put in the Father is the faith that you should be putting in me. He went on in John's gospel to say, Abraham saw me and rejoiced when he saw me in that day. Jesus said that. Think about this for a moment. I don't know you all. I mean, I know a lot of you, <laughs> but not all of you. So you may be here today and you say, I just walked in. I just got in here. Jesus, who, what, what? Listen, from Genesis to Revelation, the entire Bible focuses on one individual. Everything is supportive of this one individual. And this particular individual is somebody who is prophesied about in scripture. Watch this. According to Micah chapter five, verse two, he's eternal. Micah five, verse two. Whoever he is, he's eternal 
and he's the Messiah, Micah 5 verse 2 says, and you'll find him being born in Bethlehem. You thought that was a Hallmark card, didn't you? You thought that was a Christmas thing. Micah 5 verse 2 was written 522 years before Jesus was born. Isaiah tells us about Jesus, that the governments of the world will rest upon his shoulders. He will be conceived by or within a virgin. Bible says that. 750, 746 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah the prophet. Every Jew knew this. Psalm 22 announces that the Messiah will be crucified in his hands and his feet, and he will be pierced in his side. Written 1,000 years before Jesus was born. Did you know that? It says in that same psalm that they will throw dice for his garment rather than tear it apart. Jesus. Not Joseph Smith, not Chuck Smith, not Chuck Swindoll, not the Pope, not Billy Graham, not me, not you. The Bible is written about one central figure. The centrality of the Bible is Jesus Christ. He goes by so many names in the scripture, like the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. All of these declarations of his name, guess where they come from? Old Testament. That's why today, if you know any Jewish friends, I have many Jewish friends, if they read Genesis to Malachi, which is the Old Testament, skip the entire New Testament and read the book of Revelation, a Jew will understand it quicker than most of us Gentiles. The book of Revelation is profoundly Jewish for a big reason that we can't talk about today. We don't have the time. But Jesus says in John 14, look at this. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. That is a 100% declaration of divinity. Christ equated himself with the Father, which means Christ declared himself to be God. In my Father's house are many mansions. That's a cool word. Mansion. Some of you who moved from California probably bought a mansion here. <laughs> you moved from a thousand square foot shack and you sold it for a bundle and you moved here and you could buy a mansion. I don't know if it's true anymore, but the word uh, mansion, everybody wants to talk. Scholars bicker back and forth. Um, the word mansion, it can't be mansions. Well, the word actually means very ornate, very fantastic, very spectacular dwelling place. At the minimum, it's a very spectacular dwelling place within the city of God. Okay, That's, it's interpreted that way. It's also interpreted as you actually living in an actual very, very beautiful place in the kingdom of heaven. And I want you to remember this for a moment. Jesus Christ came to earth, died on the cross for our sins, I guess I should announce, you, you know, you're here because you're a sinner. Did you know that? If I've not offended you yet, here it comes. You're a sinner like me. Bad thoughts, bad intentions, bad doings. Here's the good news. Whoever in here is the biggest sinner, Jesus says, that's the one who's forgiven. That one loves the most. Isn't that great? You can't rule yourself out unless you're a weirdo. God wants you in heaven. If you're not going, why are you not going? Well, because I don't believe in God. I believe in science. No, you don't. Because the God that invented everything is the God of all science. Well, I don't believe in God because when I was growing up, a pastor, he upset me when I was nine years old. That's, that's what happens in life. That pastor didn't die on the cross for you. What did Jesus ever do to you? Listen, let's be honest. People rip us off all the time. That's what people do. Well, I can't go to any church because they're all full of hypocrites. Oh, join one. You'll feel comfortable. <laughs> I mean, come on. Look, I'm from California, born and raised. What's a speed limit? I think it's a suggestion. I don't see it in the Ten Commandments. But as soon as I see the, the sign posted, now I'm a sinner. I crossed the line. Are you with me? We're all sinners. The Bible says all of sin and come short of the glory of God. Every single one of us. Now, for some of you sitting here right now, say, I'm, I find this person highly offensive. He's telling I came here. I drove all this way to be told I was a sinner. Sinners get to have a savior. His name is Jesus if you trust him. Listen, he is the way out of this mess. It's not Tennessee. It's... Uh, 
I was just thinking, how bad? You need to come home with me. I think people in California are going to enjoy heaven more. <laughs> right? You and I are living our lives right now because God has kept you and I here for a very, very great purpose. And, and yet, listen to what Jesus has to say. He's announcing to them that in my Father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. Watch, I go to prepare a place for you. Can you take your index finger, please stick it up, index finger, and point to heaven? Okay? Now, if I would have, so, so watch, where's Jesus? Yeah, okay, well, you got it right. If I ask this question in children's ministry, their fingers go like this. Oh, it's true, though. It's true. You're going to heaven, but according to Jesus himself, he said, I'm going to come dwell within you, and I'll do that by the Holy Spirit. He dwells within his believers. And my challenge to you today is this, as we look at this wonderful promise, is the Bible says these things have been written that you might know you have eternal life. And I'm going to float this out to you. If Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many mansions, dwelling places of incredible opulence and joy. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go now to prepare a place for you. I go now to prepare a place for you. That where I am, there you may be also. Did you get that? Look at your Bible. Jesus is inviting the disciples to a reality that from this moment on, not only in their ministry, but in their entire lives all the way through to today, is the believer's thrill, excitement, and joy that when we are done living in this world, we go to be with him. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Did you know that? So well, my church taught me something different, that I'm going to go to some, some place and have to wait it out. Not in the Bible. The believer, listen, if you died right here, right now, or the rapture happened, and I got a little jingle that I say, we're either going to go rapture or we're going to go rupture. As a believer, before, if I drop dead before I hit this floor, don't, don't run up on the stage and say, Lord, bring them back, Jesus. <laughs> Bring, heal them, heal them. Don't do that. Just say, wow. <laughs> Paul said, it's so true and it's so real that Paul the Apostle said, there's a need for me to continue here to ministry, Paul said, which is good. But he said, it's way better if I could depart and be with the Lord. Does that sound radical? It is radical, but the Christian life is radical. We know where we're going. He's got us here for a reason, and it's to advance the kingdom of God. That means wherever you live, whatever you're doing, you are to be advancing the gospel by acts of love and kindness, whatever. Care for others. Do you have an enemy? Is there somebody that just hates you? Let's be honest. Is there somebody that you hate? And you know you're not supposed to. Jesus is saying, watch it. Your heart's not right toward them. That's the person that God is saying to you, I want you to bless them. And you're going, nope. And he's saying, I want you to bless them. You know it's their birthday coming up. They can't stand you. You can't stand them. But I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to you. Send them a card and just say, I hope you have a great year. So I can't do that. You should do it because that will set you free. And when Jesus said, it's as though you're heaping coals of fire in someone's head, acts of goodness, that's an act of goodness, coals of fire on their head, that's a good thing. No time to talk about it now, it's just a good thing. It's like somebody bringing over, you know, DoorDash, the, the food comes to your house, it's a blessing. Bless them, because why? Because then they'll start thinking thoughts about your God. Okay, watch out for bubbles. When we get self-protective, we're not going to be bringing anybody else to heaven with us when that's what we're commissioned to do, okay? So even though we know where we're going, we know our retirement program is fantastic. It's with Jesus. But watch what happens. When he tells us that we're not to let our hearts be troubled, I want you to keep a few things in mind, and it's this. When Jesus said, I'm going to pick you up and take you to where I'm at, does anybody know what that's called? Thank you. Can you say it louder? 
Rapture. Now, why is the word rapture not being mentioned in churches anymore? Did you know that the doctrine of the rapture is under attack? Like never before. You hear the things that are, people are saying, pastors won't even talk about it. And it's in the Bible. You say, I've never read the word in the Bible. Do you, do you speak and read Latin? If you do, it's in the Latin Bible. The word rapture is from the Latin. We use it because that's the popular word. In English, it's two words compounded, caught up. If you're Greek, listen to Greek. It's funny, Greek, it sounds like it's Italian. Greek is harpazo. Oh, I'd like to have a parzo with extra sauce. <laughs> right? Doesn't that sound great? Harpazo if you're Greek. What does it mean? It means to be violent, re, violently removed from earth. Taken away in a twinkling of an eye. Does that sound familiar to you? In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible says there's going to be an event. Write it down, please. There's going to be an event when people are living their lives and all of a sudden, in a twinkling of an eye, they pass from life to eternal life without death. They're instantly changed in a flash. Where's that? 1 Corinthians 15. Mark that down in your thing. You say, I don't believe it. Just write it down. It's not going to hurt you. Write it down. And notice this, that Jesus is the one that introduces the doctrine of the rapture. I'm going away. Don't let your heart be troubled. I'm leaving. And I'm going to go prepare a place for you. Can I encourage you guys if you've never seen Before the Wrath, has anybody even heard of it? Go to Amazon Prime and watch Before the Wrath. It's about a Galilean wedding, uniquely Galilean. The, bride, the, the, the groom would go away to his father's house, prepare on the top of the father's house another house. And when the father thought or thinks that the house is worthy enough, then he tells his son, now you can go get your bride. The entire time since the moment the son started building on top the father's house in Israel, she, they are engaged. And most of the time in that entire year, they barely see each other. It's the father that says, go get her. Do you remember when Jesus says, nobody knows when I get to come back? Not me, not the angels, only my father. That's, that's an allusion to a Galilean wedding. When Jesus was on earth, technically, listen, we believe right now Jesus doesn't know when he's coming back to get you, to get me. Because it's the father that will say, perfect son, plus he's a carpenter, pretty cool. <laughs> Go get her. And he arrived, look, John 14, does it say anything about John 14, him landing on earth? Is there anything about John 14 about the second coming? No. The first coming was Jesus to Jerusalem, to Israel. Say amen, right? You got that? Amen. By the way, what the second coming is the same. Jesus comes to Jerusalem and to Israel, right? Are you with me? In both cases, he's going to be hailed as king, right? Isn't it interesting that Israel's in the news now? What, why is it in the news? Because there's an entire religion that believes Israel should not exist. Well, God says it has to exist. Israel's got a lot of war ahead of it, according to the Bible, but Israel's not going anywhere. Did you know that? Why? Because in the second coming, Satan knows the Bible too. In the second coming, when Christ Jesus comes back, he wants to flub it up. Satan wants to flub it up. Because you know, he's the father of all lies, right? What happens to, what, what happens to liars when they lie? They're a perpetual or a habitual liar. It's one of the, it's one of the characteristics of Satan. When a person tells a lie, after they've told it a certain amount of time, a lie carries a judgment with it. It's like a, you know those things? I used to hate these things. <laughs> Remember those little music boxes with a clown inside? I used to have nightmares about that thing. And the thing, oy, that clown comes out, and it would scare me. Listen. Satan knows the word of God and he tells a lie. He tells it long enough that he begins to believe what he's been saying. That's what happens to us when we tell lies long enough. We actually believe it's reality. It's a curse. It's actually a curse. So Satan's a liar. And I believe that Satan believes that he's going to somehow destroy Israel and Jerusalem so Jesus can't come back. 
Did you know the Ottoman Empire buried Gentile bodies in front of the Eastern Gate in the year 1010? Because they had read the Bible in the book of Ezekiel and they said, a Jew cannot return. Jesus cannot return now. We put Gentile bodies in front of the gate that he has to go through. Isn't it amazing? Listen, in John 14, he doesn't come to the earth. He says, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. You already pointed to where that's at. I'm going to come and take you to myself that where I am, or can I say where I've been working on this, I'll, I'll take you there. Do you all have that? Did you hear? I just said, that's the second time I've done this. I said, y'all. I said it last night and I just said it again. What an amazing thing to say, because listen, the Bible teaches that you and I are to be waiting for Jesus moment by moment, day by day. Concerning the second coming, there is no challenge in scripture to be waiting for his appearance. You want to know why? The second coming has at least 200 Bible verses that must be fulfilled before Christ comes back to Jerusalem in the second coming. And here's what's fun about this, you guys. There are those, your friends will tell you, I don't believe in the rapture. That's invented by some man. No, it's not. It's invented by Jesus Christ himself. Hey, how about this? You want to turn over? Do you have your Bibles? Or am I doing all this by myself? (laughs) Go Go to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. And... Chapter 4. See if there's a correlation. See if you get this. When those people knock on your door, your friends, my church doesn't teach that Jesus could come back today or at any moment. I should insert at this time, 2 Peter 2 warns us. Are you listening, everyone? 2 Peter 2 2 says that in the last days, scoffers will come, mocking saying, where is the promise of his coming? Everything has stayed the same. Jesus warned in one of his parables, beware of those who say, my Lord delays his return. That attitude that's in the world, you you and I know people like this, I'll get my life right with God when when something happens. They're gambling. They've got better odds in Vegas than they do living life like that. And yet God, listen, according to the Bible, he's coming back for those that are looking for him, that are waiting for him. And I, per, I firmly believe that a true believer is going to be living and looking for his return. I believe that goes with the teaching of God's word. So Jesus starts it. He's the one that started. You take your friends to John 14. And then you take in the 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But I do not want, this is Paul speaking, but I do not want you to be ignorant. The word ignorant is, I do not want you to be untaught or uninformed. How many churches are uninformed about what we're going to hear? Concerning those who have fallen asleep, let me explain that. The believers adopted a beautiful thing in the first century church. When you die, you you look like you're sleeping. The reference is to the physical body. They would reference, they would say, um, to those who sleep or have fallen asleep. Their soul and spirit is with the Lord. Their body you bury. (laughs) And that body stays in the ground until the resurrection. You all tracking with me? It's really too quiet in here for me right now. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Grandpa dies. You put him in the ground. But grandpa's not there. You know how you have grandpa's Memorial service, he ain't there. He's gone, but his body's there. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, we are body, soul, and spirit. We are a trichotomy. What God is imperfect, we are imperfect. Body, soul, and spirit. Father, Son, Holy Holy Spirit. So, Paul says to these beautiful believers who were mourning the loss of their loved ones, He says, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with 
him, those who sleep in Jesus. My mom is up there. My dad, my sister is up there. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. That's awesome. That we, Paul says we, he includes himself, not them, not those, not in the future. Paul says that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede or preempt those who are asleep. Translation, there's going to be a day, we don't know when that is, when the saints are alive, Paul throws himself in there, that when Christ comes, those that have died before us, something's going to happen. We're alive, but they're dead bodies, what's going to happen? It says in verse 16, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. Notice that's John 14, verses 1, 2, and 3. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Their bodies will pop out of the ground. Resurrected bodies. That's, what, that's the hope of the believer. We're Christians if you're Jewish, you believe in resurrection. Christian, you believe in resurrection. Jesus was not reincarnated. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And if you died today and you went to heaven today, we were doing your service and we're here somewhere at the, at the gravesite and we're putting you in the ground and all of a sudden we hear a trumpet blast. Your lid of your coffin blows open. You go up first and we follow behind you <laughs> trying to catch up to you. The Bible says that you're going to rise first. But watch how this happens. And listen, how many of you have loved ones in heaven? You know that you have loved ones in heaven. Yeah, and don't you think even your little Yorkshire Terrier is in heaven too? Isn't your hunting dog in heaven? No? In California, it's like a screaming, overwhelming yes. Everybody's dog in, heaven, in California is born again, I guess. It's very cute. Yes, my dog goes. So listen to this. So the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead of Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. That's the word rapture in Latin. In the Latin language. If you have a Latin Bible, it says rapture. Right there. If it's a Greek Bible, it's harpazo. Right there. English, caught up. Together with who? Who's the them? Who is the them? The ones that popped up, right? The Pop-Tarts. <laughs> right? So we're having your service. We put you in the ground. Imagine that day. Burp, 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 and <laughs> there, there goes Grandpa. It's going to happen someday. You say, I don't know about that. In a sense, it already happened. No, I mean, this hasn't happened. It's happened once before. Remember when Jesus Christ, read Matthew 27 carefully. It's radical. Jesus is crucified. He shouts, Totelestai, it's finished. And then he dismisses his spirit. It's called Passover, right? Jesus dies on the cross. What does the Bible say? The Bible says there was a great earthquake at that moment. And it says many of the tombs of those that believed who were buried, the people came out of the tombs and walked into Jerusalem. And it happened, it says, after his resurrection as well. Wow. Can you imagine? Mike, was that Uncle Bob that just walked by? I thought we buried him two weeks ago. <laughs> Could you imagine? It says they went into the city. Oh, that had to freak people out. That's absolutely awesome. But watch, this is the best part. They will be caught up together with them, where church, on the ground? In the clouds. Why? John 14. John 14. Because Jesus is going to leave the place where he is. He's going to come and pick us up and take us back to where he is. Because he's prepared a place for us. And what it says, to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Don't get in a fight about this. Listen, is this not good news? You say, wait a minute. Are you telling me that if I die, if I'm a Christian and I die, I immediately wake up the next moment in the presence of the Lord? Yep. Amen. And when he comes back, it says here that my body's going to pop up out of the ground? Yep, it's going to be glorified like his is. 
Well, what about those that are living at the moment of the rapture? And, they're, and 1 Thessalonians 15 says, and in twinkling of an eye, they're changed. I hope that happens today. In fact, I hope it happens like in nine minutes and 25 seconds because I'll be done at that moment. And what a great way to end a church service, right? And on the way up, I'm going to be going, see, <laughs> told you. There'll be this incredible instantaneous transformation. That's not some lore or some idea from a movie or a book series. It's scripture. Jesus said, building a place for you. He's been building for 2,000 years. God made everything in six days. Can you imagine 2,000 years? I have to confess, I, I, um, I had a... I see things, it's so strange. I had like a vapor lock when it came to thinking about heaven. In my life, because I'm part crazy, is I see everything in technicolor. I really do. I see, I see things in cartoons. I probably need a doctor or an evaluation. <laughs> but people always say, how do you remember my name? It's because I see cartoons over, over and around people's heads. When somebody starts talking, my mind just goes to this thing, and I associate their name with that thing, and then five years later, I meet them, and I go, hey, Bob, how you doing? He's, how do you know my name? Because I saw you as a huge clown five years ago in my head. <laughs> no, you don't tell them that part. But I see things very colorful. To me, when the sky's blue, it's so blue. When it's so green outside, it's so green. Right now, California's perfect. We left there, it was 80 degrees. Those mountains are covered in snow many feet of snow and the hills are exploding velvet green with purple and yellow and all of these flowers we're having a super bloom it's, it's for this moment if it wasn't for people it'd be just perfect <laughs> right or politics but it's just wonderful in my life for some reason i always saw heaven white floors white walls wearing white robes white ceiling and very very quiet and it's like, glad you're here. What are you doing here? <laughs> right? It's like, and I don't know where I got that from, but it's wrong. And I read the book by uh, Randy Alcorn. If you ever want to read a book on theology of heaven, don't read anybody's books on heaven. Because this guy, I, my, I, this, that, forget it. Read the book Heaven by Randy Alcorn. It's a theology. It's systematic theology of heaven. You'll be so blessed. What God has taken us to, when Jesus isn't preparing a place, Paul the Apostle announced that it's so beautiful that he couldn't even articulate it and he wasn't going to speak about it in this world when he got a glimpse of it. That's where you're going if you're trusting Christ. I hope you are. Because get a load of this. Revelation chapter 19, for time's sake I'll paraphrase it, but will you write these verses down? We're talking about John 14, verses 1, 2, and 3. We're talking about 1 Corinthians 15, 50 to 57, and we're talking about 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 to 18, and then we'll end with this. In the book of Revelation, chapter 4, John is receiving the revelation from Jesus. Everybody got that? Book of Revelation. The next thing John says is he heard a trumpet speaking to him. John. He hears a trumpet speaking to him. And what does the trumpet say? Does anybody know what it says? Yeah. Come up. Interesting. He said, what's the big deal about that? Only this. The church is never again from that moment found in the Bible. It's no longer mentioned from John 14, uh, Revelation chapter 4 on. Can't find it. It's gone. Did you know that? So your friends who say, well, we're going to go through the tribulation. You better buy a bunch of food. You better put a helmet on because the Antichrist is coming. Listen, they might want to go through all that, but the Bible doesn't teach that. Oh, the, the tribulation period's coming. But it can't come until God begins to reveal himself to the nation of Israel. Ezekiel 38, 37, and 36 says so. Did you know this? How long is the tribulation period, everybody? Seven years. Does anybody remember what year? Did you know that Jesus had to die in a certain year? According to Daniel. 
The book of Daniel tells us that Jesus had the Messiah had to come in the 483rd year of Daniel's prophecy. Did you know that? God said to Israel, because you have not kept your Sabbaths, you have robbed me from letting the land rest. Therefore, you owe me 490 years. I'm going to take it from you because you didn't give it to me. And he gives an outline in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, about when the Messiah would arrive and the pause that would take place. And on the 483rd year was the very year that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead and ascended back to heaven. It's been 2,000 years of a predominantly Gentile age where the gospel has been going out. But God said, 490 you owe me. The seven years is all about Israel. The church is nowhere mentioned. And here's where I drop the mic moment. You say, I disagree with you, Pastor, because isn't the church mentioned down at the other end of the Bible in Revelation? Sure is. Good observation. It's Revelation 19. Where is she found? Anybody remember? She's in heaven. And she's awesome. The Bible says the church is in heaven. And the Bible says that she has fine linen, clean and right. She's not wearing robes. This should freak you out. Old Testament saints, the Bible says in heaven, they wear white robes. The tribulation saints, that is those believers who died during the seven-year tribulation period of time, which John says they're more than, than he could count. By the way, do you guys all know how evangelism is going to start with 144,000? Jewish, not Jehovah Witnesses. Jewish, right? They're, they're Jewish males, virgins who speak Hebrew. 144,000 of them. 12,000 from each tribe. They start evangelizing the world and they're anointed. Can you imagine having 144,000 Paul the Apostles turned loose? Maybe with the internet too. People are coming to the Lord. John said, I couldn't even number them all. Here's what's cool. The next thing is, John's in heaven and he's telling you what's going on up there. And then in Revelation chapter 19, that's the next verse you write down. These, this is your homework. I don't see anybody writing anything down. But you should. Anyway, I did my part. The, the doors, listen, he sees, he sees the door opened and in front of him is Jesus on a white horse. And with him is the armies of heaven. Old Testament saints wear white robes. Tribulation saints, Old Testament saints, white robes. The church is never given a robe. If you've been looking forward to a robe, you don't get a robe. It says that the church gets fine linen, clean and bright. It's a wedding gown. But she's quite a girl. Because she's on horses. We're on horses. It says that we follow him. Now, please don't hate me, but I'm not a horse person. We have, we, we have horses in our city. I don't do horses. I hate animals that are smarter than me, for one thing. <laughs> but um, apparently I'm going to have a transformation. I'm going to like a horse enough to sit on it. And the Bible says in Revelation 19 and 20, you need to read it, that we come back in the second coming with Christ. The church does. My question to you is, how'd she ever get up there? How'd she get there? See, there's people today trying to rob your joy because Paul says in Titus 2.13 that we are to be waiting for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Does that thrill you? Yes. And listen, I want to encourage you. Don't answer out loud. Are you a born again believer? And if you are, you know that you are. Because the Holy Spirit inside bears witness with your spirit. You're my child. If you're not sure, then go try to do something stupid and he'll let you know. <laughs> if you don't hear anything, you need Jesus. <laughs> People will say, I never heard the Lord speak to me. Really? Try having a bad thought for a minute. Doesn't he like, excuse me, Jack, I can see that. We don't do that anymore. He'll convict you because he lives inside of you. But the, the non-believer's like, well, I don't see anything wrong with that. No, there's a lot wrong with that. Church, be strong. Be looking for his coming. The Bible says in 1 John that all those who have this hope will purify themselves even as Christ is pure. And that doesn't mean we're sinless, but we would be if we could be. Right? We can't right now. We're dragging this carcass around. That's why we have to die. For the believer, in fact, the apostle Peter used the verbiage, 
When time comes to die, it's to weigh anchor, cut the anchor loose. Think about this body right now ties us to this earth. If you could get away with it, look, I'm a grandparent. If I could be convinced that my grandkids were going to be okay and that my daughters would be okay and that my wife would be okay. My wife's already, she's okay. <laughs> if, if I knew that and the doctor came in to me tomorrow and, and said, you have five minutes to live, I would say, what a merciful God you are. I'm honestly telling you the truth. If the thought of death scares you, that's the Holy Spirit saying, you're not ready. Do you remember COVID? How many of you in here are doctors or nurses or scientists? Raise your hands. I'm not going to call you out. Just raise your hands. Okay, there's something we know. I, I worked in a research lab for 13 years in bioengineering. There's one thing, we, there's one thing nobody told you that we know. The mask that we went and bought at Walmart. <laughs> right, Penny? The mask that we were wearing. I don't know if you wore masks. We didn't wear masks in California. We did whatever we could to upset the governor. <laughs> we even went to the beach. You know what we did? We sang out loud. He said, you, you can sing, but you can't sing out loud. <laughs> Here's the deal. Did you know that nobody at the CDC walks into a laboratory with viruses wearing a mask? What do they wear? A pressurized spacesuit. Don't they? You want to know why? Viruses go right through masks. There are not here, but there's still people in California wearing a mask. Do you know what, do you know what that means? It means you're supposed to evangelize them. <laughs> why do I say that? Because they're terrified. What are you what are you scared of? Look, you still know people, right? I mean, I would imagine Tennessee's got one person that you would see them and they go like this. They walk away from you like you are the virus. Listen, our hearts should go out to them. They're terrified of getting sick. Why are you terrified of getting sick? Everybody gets sick. Because I don't want to die. Do I have a deal for you? <laughs> I hope you're trusting Jesus. We need to exercise his presence more in our life than ever before. Our friends are being terrified by the news. We've got the answer in these earthen vessels of ours. We need to speak up. We need to speak up. Be winsome, be loving, be kind, but tell your friends the truth. And listen, blame me. You can say, well, this lunatic came from California, said this at church. Isn't that weird? See, what, see if they take the bait. He said, like, so many people are afraid to die. And then listen to the response and see what happens. But let's pray right now together. Father, we bow our heads before you, and Lord, we ask you right now in your precious name, Jesus, that in this gathering today, right now, right here, if your Holy Spirit is speaking to someone and, and saying to them, you're, you're uncertain, you're unsure, you don't have the peace, joy, and confidence of being one of my little lambs. You're not sure if you know my voice. I have good news for you right now, friend, as I interrupt my prayer. If you are hearing or feeling or sensing a little bit of a sting, where that's a little bit of a tweak, where yikes, I think I might fall into that category. Well, first of all, glory be to God. He's actually speaking to you right now, and he wants you to do something about it. There may be some of you that's just saying, I'm glad this is over. I can't wait to go bowling. You don't care. You don't care anything about heaven. You don't, you don't care about Jesus. And even if you went to heaven, you'd be all bummed out about it because you don't want to be there. Well, one of the birthmarks of a child of God is that we can't wait to see the one who loves us the most. If you think today you've sinned so much that God can't forgive you, stop flattering yourself. Your sin's not bigger than his blood. You're a really bad person. Good for you. Jesus said that person who repents of their sin and believes in me, that person is forgiven so much that that's the person who loves me the most. That is called a redemptive God, my friend. 
He redeems. And may you put your trust in him. In Jesus' name, amen.